Hello and welcome to this session on the top system design interview questions and answers by IntelliPad. System design, the art of breaking down complex models into individual modules, which is both efficient and reliable. It also involves creating a detailed plan for building a systems' architecture that meets business requirements. In recent years, system design has become an increasingly common concept, even for freshers with no prior experience. However, to some people, it can easily become a tricky and frustrating concept to grasp due to the intricacies involved in designing an entire systems' architecture. And it's not just for freshers. If you're aiming for FANG companies, then system design again becomes a common step particularly for mid to senior level positions. With over 1000 job opportunities and an average salary of 11 lakhs per annum, it's clear that system design has become an essential skill for both freshers and experienced professionals. And that's why we have created this video. Now without any further ado, let's jump right in. Before beginning the interview, the interviewer might be curious to understand your definition of system design. Or in other words, what is your take on system design? System design involves designing efficient and reliable systems while also making sure it can meet both functional and non-functional requirements. Or in other words, it involves breaking down a complicated problem into manageable parts and designing a structure that is efficient, scalable, reliable and maintainable. Functional requirements include what the system should do, like what your website or app should do when the users interact with them. Non-functional requirements include your app or website's ability to handle factors that are not directly visible to the users, such as its ability to handle growing traffic, providing correct and consistent data, minimizing downtime, etc. Basically, non-functional requirements equals to the back end of your website and functional requirements equals to the front end. Moving on to the next question, what are the key differences between stateful and stateless systems? In a very simple context, stateful systems are when user interaction happens in multiple steps and the previous actions matter, meaning the systems need to remember past user interactions. Like when a user visits a website, say Amazon, and adds an item to their cart, the user clicks add to cart on a product and now the system needs to remember that the user added a laptop to their cart. Finally, if the user proceeds to check out, then the system needs to retrieve the item the user added to the cart or the laptop. Stateless systems, on the other hand, are used when the previous user interaction does not matter. RESTful services like Google Maps API, Amazon API Gateway, or Access API don't need to remember a previous state in order to fetch the data from their respective servers. Moving on to our third question, what is a load balancer and why is it used? A load balancer is a device or a system that distributes the incoming traffic across multiple servers, ensuring that no single server becomes overwhelmed. A load balancer is used to maximize efficiency, enhance reliability by redirecting traffic to healthy servers and achieve high fault tolerance by redirecting traffic to available servers. The load balancer receives a request from the client and then proceeds to decide which server should handle this request based on predefined algorithms or rules. Additionally, the load balancer keeps on checking the health of the servers, ensuring that no requests are sent to the servers that are down or unresponsive. Moving on to our next question, what is fault tolerance and how do you design a fault tolerance system? Fault tolerance is the ability of a system to continue operating properly even when some components within the system fail or stop functioning. A fault tolerance system must be designed in such a way that it can anticipate, detect and handle failures gracefully without significantly affecting the user's experience or the system's functionality. In the event of a system failure, there are certain things that you can do to design a fault-tolerant system. And they are as follows. Duplicating critical components. So if one fails, another one can take over. Integrating failover mechanisms so that if the primary server fails, the standby servers can immediately switch places. Maintaining multiple copies of data across nodes or regions to ensure availability. Distributing traffic among multiple servers to avoid overloading a single server. Additionally, you can monitor systems regularly to detect failures early. We've almost reached the middle of the module. Moving on to our mid or our fifth question. What is caching and why is it important in system design? Caching is the process of storing frequently accessed data in a temporary storage layer called a cache layer. Now this cache resides closer to the client or application than the primary data source so that requests for the same data can be served faster. Caching plays a crucial role in system design because it significantly improves performance. 
meaning a user sitting in Mumbai and a user sitting in Germany will be able to access a website located in India at the same time. Caching also reduces the load on primary servers by offloading the frequently accessed data to multiple servers. Additionally, caching also provides fault tolerance by serving as a backup in case the primary server becomes temporarily available, which in turn improves the system's reliability. Now that you have understood the concept of caching, let's put it into use with our sixth question. What is the purpose of a content delivery network? A CDN or a content delivery network is a distributed network of servers strategically located across the globe to deliver content to users more quickly. The content or the data stored inside the CDN servers is called cached content. So in a nutshell, the primary purpose of a CDN is to bring the content from the origin server to its end users as quickly as possible by caching it at distributed edge locations closer to the user. This reduces latency, improves load times and increases reliability. Moving on to our next question, what is the difference between horizontal and vertical scaling? Horizontal scaling involves adding more machines or instances to a system to handle the increasing workload. Or in other words, you distribute the workload across multiple servers. Usually, a load balancer is responsible for splitting the workload across multiple servers. Although horizontal scaling can provide high fault tolerance, managing multiple servers can sometimes become hectic. Vertical scaling, on the other hand, involves making the existing system powerful by increasing the resources such as CPU, RAM and storage so that it can handle more load. So instead of adding more servers like horizontal scaling, you make the current server more powerful. Vertical scaling is easier to manage as compared to horizontal scaling as there are fewer servers to manage. But there is a physical limit to how much a single server can be scaled. So scalability is limited. Plus, if the single server fails, the entire application or the service goes down. Both horizontal and vertical scaling have their pros and cons. So if you're handling unpredictable traffic across large-scale web applications, go for horizontal scaling. However, if you're dealing with a smaller application with predictable load, then go for vertical scaling. Moving on to our next question. What is the CAP theorem? The CAP theorem or Brewer's theorem is a fundamental principle that states that at most, only two out of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance can be achieved by distributed systems. Consistency means that at any given time, if one node updates data, then all corresponding nodes will reflect that update almost immediately. Availability refers to guaranteeing that every request, be it read or write, will receive a response no matter what. So basically, we're ignoring the possibility of a system or node failure. Partition tolerance highlights that even if there is a network partition, meaning that some nodes are not able to communicate with each other, still the system will continue to function correctly. Or in other words, the system can handle temporary network failures between nodes without crashing. So now according to our CAP theorem, only one of these combinations, CA, CP or AP is possible. Moving on to our next question, what is microservices architecture and how is it different from a monolithic architecture? In very simple terms, a monolithic application is like a single train where everything works together as one big unit. A microservice, on the other hand, is like a bunch of cars where each individual car can work as a separate unit, which implies that even if one of the car breaks down, the others would keep on working. In technical terms, a monolithic architecture is a traditional software design architecture where the entire application is built as a single unified unit. All the components within the application, like all the components within a train, like the UI, business logic, and database, are tightly bound together and run within the same process. So if one part fails to boot, the entire application will come crashing down. Microservice architecture, on the other hand, is a software design pattern where an application is built as a collection of small, independently deployable services, much like our cars from the earlier example, for payment processing, user authentication, etc. Hence, even if an individual car stops working, the rest of them will continue to work. Moving on to our last question of this module, what is sharding in database design? Sharding is a technique where a large database is split into smaller, more manageable parts called shards. Think of it like a huge library, which is split into different sections based on the books it contains. So if you were looking for a computer science book, then you would not go search the whole library. Instead, you will go straight to the computer science section. Hence, effectively making the process faster and more efficient. As to how sharding works, the database is divided into chunks based on a specific sharding key, 
such as user ID, geographic location, etc. And each chunk is stored on a different server. When a query is made, the system uses this particular sharding key to locate which shard contains the data and routes the user request to that particular shard. Some examples of sharding include popular social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, e-commerce websites such as Amazon, and online multiplayer gaming platforms. That was the end of this video. If you found it useful, then make sure to give this video a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to never miss out on any updates from us.